Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. I'm Sandra, and I'm just the professional your small business was looking for. But you didn't hire me because you didn't use LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn has professionals you can't find anywhere else, including those who aren't actively looking for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role, like me. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you'll miss out on great candidates like Sandra. Start hiring professionals like a professional. Post your free job on linkedin.com slash spoken today. Burrow sofas are built for the way you live. With thousands of possible configurations, their five-seating collections fit any decor. From classic mid-century style to sleek contemporary design, Burrow sofas are made to last and grow with you. You can add seats whenever and easily assemble your updated sofa with no tools needed. And free shipping always? That's just the cherry on top. Right now, save up to 50% during Burrow's spring sale at burrow.com slash ACAST. Burrow.com slash ACAST. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all of my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I am just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Vasya Sarantopoulou, a psychologist, mental health educator and relationship counsellor with more than 15 years of experience. She believes in kindness, humanity, realistic positivity, balance and connection. And she is the founder of Anti-Loneliness, a company offering mental health services in the Netherlands and worldwide. Vasya, how are you? I am doing fine. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to be here and uh, discuss with you. I'm really glad you agreed to come on because we're going to talk about loneliness. And it's something that comes up again and again in the research, in messages I get. So how did you get into, first of all, your work as a psychologist and counsellor? And where did your interest in loneliness particularly come from? Now, I started uh, studying psychology in the previous century. It was 1998. (laughs) (laughs) Back then, I think mainly because I wanted to understand human nature. What is it that drives human behaviors? Why we choose to behave in that way and not another? And Clearly, from a perspective of curiosity, I was very curious to understand why people um, yeah, behave and react the way they do. That's what drove me there. The loneliness interest actually came way later. So I was already, it was 2014, 15, and I was here already in the Netherlands. Originally, I'm from Greece. And it was just one year after I moved to the Netherlands. Maybe that also uh, played some role Because when you're an expert, when you transition to a new country, of course, you experience feelings of loneliness in a sense of finding true belonging again. 
But then I wanted to find a name for my practice, and I didn't want to name it Vasya's Counseling, you know, which is very, very common in, in our uh, field. And I was looking for a name, and I was and I asked myself, what is it something that everybody experiences, no matter what, no matter their mental health state, no matter their challenges in their life, what is something that we all go through universally? And that, that was loneliness. We all experience loneliness at some point in our lives because loneliness exists in places of transition. Any change in our lives comes with loneliness. You become a new mom. <laughs> you are experiencing loneliness, even though we don't know about that. You move to a new country. You move to a new job. You, you, of course, you, you break up, you divorce, of course, you experience loneliness. Any place of transition includes loneliness. And unfortunately, we don't talk a lot about that. There's a stigma around it. So that's, that's why, that's when it started. People feel like it's a bit shameful to admit they're lonely, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And when you say to somebody, you know, I'm feeling lonely, you can see the... The distance in their eye, they, you can see also the shame. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, ju just go out, meet people, as if it's about the number of people you know, which is nothing like that. You can be sitting next to your partner and still feel lonely, and you can be all by yourself and and not feel lonely. So it's not about the. It's different than the alone. It's being alone and it's feeling lonely and they can be completely different. So what are some common causes of loneliness that you come across? I know you mentioned transitions there. Yeah, transition is one of them. And, and also keep in mind that I see loneliness as a, as a two-layer emotion. The first one is a very normal feeling we all experience and that comes with the transition we said before of course i moved to a new country of course i'm going to feel lonely of course i don't have so nobody here and also my family my friends are in a different country so there's a first layer which is absolutely normal expected and it signals how much we value connections and then there's a second layer of loneliness which is when we get trapped in the first layer, and we start creating a structure of accompanying feelings, beliefs, and behaviors that lead to even deeper loneliness. So we start believing that we are not worthy of friends. We start believing that there's something wrong with us. Um, we start feeling fear to go out, reach out to other people, uh, we feel intimidated by the perspective of rejection and behaviors. We start isolating more. We start rationalizing. Oh, fine. I don't need, you know, friends. Netflix and pizza are my friends. I have my dog. I don't need. So we start creating behaviors uh, where we keep people at arm's length and we don't allow them to come closer to us. And that leads to even more loneliness. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of easier to say, I don't need friends than risk the rejection of trying to make friends, the potential yeah. rejection. And I can tell you a story about that, a personal story. May I? Mm, please. So when I was here and in the Netherlands and I made, I made some friends during my studies, because I was doing a second master in psychology, I, do, I did some friends during that period. And, you know, because they're all experts, it was an international university. Eventually, even after one or two years after our, our studies finished, they decided all to go back to their home country or to another country. Yeah. At the same time, I was focusing on, you know, building my practice, growing my practice here. I was very busy working and I didn't notice that I had many people to talk about work, but I didn't have people, you know, what we call friends yeah. in personal life. And I realized that. So one thing that I did, of course, I, I wrote down all the people that I had met here and that would be a possible friendship that could be created with them. 
But also I decided that I'm going to make new friends and I'm going to meet new people. And one of the things that I did is I started the photography club because I know I love photography. But another thing that I also did was I signed up for something like a Tinder, but for friends. Okay. And I was um, very, uh, how do you say, confident that I will find somebody there. But one thing that I consciously and mindfully was telling to myself was be aware you are going to be rejected. It's going to happen, yeah. but it's part of the game. So when you said, you know, we're feeling scared of getting rejected, I, I prepare myself. I prep myself like, yeah, it's going to happen. Don't worry. We get that. It's a series of no's until there's a yes. Let's get it. And eventually it happened like that. The first person that I reached out to, that she was living in a different country, and I said it's it's it was only female friends. Uh, she was uh, not in a different country, a different city, and it didn't work with her. And I was like, okay, still here, trying. And the second person that I talked to, we are still friends now, and it's it's a great let's say relationship we have. But again, it's because I consciously and I was very aware of this fear of uh, rejection. And I know that everybody's afraid of, but when you are expecting it, it's less scary than before. Yeah. So to say one more thing about the question you asked me, what are the causes? When I talk about loneliness, I also talk about loneliness, not in relation to, in relation to other people, but also re, uh, loneliness in relation to ourselves. So one cause of loneliness in our lives is also the disconnection from ourselves. If we're busy, if we're working all the time, if we're people pleasing and we are meeting other people's needs and we are um, accommodating their feelings all the time, we are abandoning our own needs, our own thoughts, our own desires, our own feelings. And as a result, and this is something that I've seen very, very often, we are disconnecting from ourselves and there comes an existential crisis at some point. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's my purpose in life. I don't know what gives me meaning. I don't even know what gives me joy. So that's also a very important source of loneliness. Yeah, yeah. So repeated studies have shown that people who hoard have very high rates of loneliness and also that people whose hoarding symptoms are worse can be more lonely than those whose symptoms are milder. From the research that's been carried out so far, it's unclear whether loneliness causes hoarding or hoarding leads to loneliness. I tend to think it's a vicious cycle situation that's a combination of both. So if people are listening, what are some warning signs of loneliness and isolation that listeners can look out for in themselves or the people they love who hoard? I, I agree with you. It's a vicious circle for sure. And I think we we said before about hoarding uh, and people who are hoarding that they are feeling very much shame because of that behavior. And feeling shame, what actually means is that I don't want to put myself out there because I don't feel I'm worthy of being in a relationship. I don't feel I'm worthy of being loved and accepted. And that leads to even more isolation. So a warning sign would be the social withdrawal. If you see people becoming more and more isolated and they don't join social gatherings, activities, or they don't even talk to people that they used to talk or as often as they used to. So they avoid even... Um, interactions with close friends or with family members. Another warning sign, and that's mainly something that the person who is hoarding can, can recognize, not somebody outside, is that when we are seeking emotional safety in objects instead of people, I have my magazines, you know, I have a, you know, a big stack of magazines and I'm okay. I'm going to have a really good fun with that. And what I what I usually say when people ask me about these coping mechanisms, I I don't want to add more shame to that. Like you have to stop with the hoarding, you have to stop with this coping. No, but that's 
that's something that has protected us for a long time or has worked in our life so that we don't feel even worse. So what I say is like putting it into a more realistic perspective, which is just keep doing it. But at the same time, practice other coping mechanisms. Uh, yes, having you know the, this stack of magazines next to you might bring you some stability, emotional safety, fantastic, but also seek uh, another way as well for emotional stability. So we can see a warning sign might be when we are relying solely on one source for our emotional needs, which is the object that we are hoarding. Another sign can be the neglect of physical appearance. This is when we stop having a sour or when we uh, we don't actually find the reason why we should, you know, do our hair or wear something nice. Yes. What's the point? What's the reason? So that's already a shift in our life. Um, changes in sleeping patterns, when we don't sleep well, when we sleep also during the day. Um, loss of interest in any activities or hobbies or anything that would take us out of the, of the house. And also talking about our mental state. Uh, feelings of hopelessness or helplessness, like we feel that there's nothing that we can do for our condition, for our situation, and um, maybe symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression. Yeah, that makes sense. And what are some of the problems that loneliness can lead to? Because I think we think that it, you know, it can be a pretty miserable situation in itself, but are there more consequences than simply feeling isolated. Yeah, it's it's like a domino. Like one thing leads to another. So uh, again, as as we said in the beginning, there's two layers of loneliness. Yes, of course, you're going to feel lonely, but once you get out of there, you're good. But once you get stuck in there and then you create this uh, structure, new structure of thoughts and, and feelings and behaviors, then you're going even deeper into the rabbit hole. So uh, in regards to uh, this domino effect that can start with isolation, we can talk about mental health uh, issues. We can talk about depression and anxiety that we said before, um, because of the lack of social support, because of the lack of meaningful connections we feel better when we are surrounded by people that make us feel important, make us feel seen and loved and accepted as we are. So if you take that away, of course, there's going to be a storm of negative thoughts, negative uh, behaviors, negative patterns in our lives. Uh, in, in some people, it can manifest as maybe low self-esteem, that they don't believe in themselves, they don't see their self-worth, uh, or they feel inadequate. But for some other people, it can even grow into a cognitive decline, like um, a loss of focus and concentration, uh, even earlier dementia, or even suicidal thoughts. And, and, and that's why I say it's a spectrum. Other people cope in different ways. But when we stay too long in that um, phase, we never know how, how, how deep the decline will be. And that's in regards to mental health. In physical health, we're also talking about maybe weakened immune system. Maybe we get sick more often. We don't have the, the strong stamina we used to have. Also, because anxiety lowers our immune system, the strength of our immune system. Uh, we talked about sleeping problems, um, uh, cardiovascular problems as well that go together with stress and anxiety and loneliness. Um, also, some people cope with this isolation with alcohol. So maybe we, we are talking about people who are using, um, abusing uh, substance or alcohol in order to cope with the pain of loneliness because it is very painful. So, yes, I think that we are talking about yeah, a very, um, very negative impact when we are staying there for too long without any support. I think the when you mentioned alcohol, it also made me think of a friend who was very lonely for a while and would sleep with people that she wasn't especially interested in 
just because it was company and it was closeness and it was quite self-destructive, but it filled something of a need and it, it was hard to watch as a friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's very correct what you're saying because sometimes, again, in um, in our effort to get out of loneliness, we overcompensate. We surrender to people that they're not right people for us, and that can also be a source of loneliness. Eh? Wrong people, um, and they can even enforce reinforce ideas about uh, how unworthy we are uh, they can they can really step on our boundaries they can really make relationships difficult and that reinforces again the idea see i told you uh, relationships are difficult it's better if i stay at home with my objects and all these things that i have because it's safer they're not gonna hurt me yeah yeah a lot of people who hoard have experienced significant trauma or grief or loss. Are those things common in people who might experience loneliness as well? Yes. And I think, again, it's the same worldview we have about relationships make us feel lonely or make us retreat into behaviors such as hoarding. And it's also one of the sources of loneliness, having been in traumatic, emotionally overwhelming experiences or relationships in the past, when we have been abused or neglected, we have the idea that people are dangerous, are a threat. We need to protect ourselves from them. So then we get stuck in either hoarding, as we say, or other coping mechanisms, or the the paradox of loneliness, where even though we want to connect, we don't connect because we know that it hurts. So yes, many people who are experiencing trauma, they isolate socially uh, because they think that they are are protecting themselves. And there is some truth in that. eh? They are protecting themselves when they are withdrawing from other people. Um, or they're hypervigilant. They, when they are around other people, they don't know how to behave. They are uh, acting in a different way than they want to, so they cannot relax in social situations. Also, people who are grieving and they have lost somebody from their life, they also feel lonely because they don't think that somebody else can understand their loss. They don't think that somebody can comfort them in their pain, or even worse, they think that they are a burden to other people when they're sharing about their loss. Uh, So it makes sense why all these trauma, loss, and loneliness, and hoarding are part of the same circle. Yeah, it's never just one simple path somewhere, is it? It's always a big mixture. I'm really lucky to have a group of, you know, a good group of friends. And I remember after a wh- after my dad died, after a while, I felt like they'll be so bored of me talking about my dad. Yeah. I will, but I can't not. And so I will just back off for a while. They had, none of them had said, we're so bored of you talking about your dad. It entirely came from me. But I withdrew because I didn't want to be boring or be repetitive and that entirely came from me not from them yeah yeah exactly exactly that's the first thing that people say and I have the people said to me when in the past I was organizing divorce support groups and they were people that they were just going through a divorce and the first thing that they said was like I cannot talk to my friends anymore about these they're sick and tired and maybe I'm going to lose them as well if I keep talking about that. And the fact that they met in a group of people that they were experiencing the same already felt safe for them to be who they are and put that shame aside and fully express themselves. And that's also what we can suggest to people who are hoarding. Meet with other people who know what you're going through. Yeah, I, I, 
I lost a number of people in a short space of time and ended up seeing a bereavement counsellor for a while. And part of what I really appreciated about that was that I was there to talk about grief. That was the purpose. And so it wasn't just that I was allowed to, I was kind of supposed to. And so I felt free then to go on about it as long as I needed to. And that was really helpful. Absolutely. And and we live in a society that practices and, and promotes very often this toxic positivity. Let's talk about the happy moments. Let's talk about the good stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about motivation and empowerment. But either in a subtle way or in a direct way, the message is don't don't bring your misery into here. Just keep it in your place. Keep it inside. You don't uh, contaminate us with your <laughs> with your negativity. You could be sad for two weeks and then yeah. back to normal, please. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's why everybody says, "Oh, it's going to be fine. Don't worry." You know, as if you're doing something wrong for worrying or for <laughs> grieving. No, these are normal feelings and we should have a normal space, a safe space for all these. And I think this is what we're learning now. As society, this is what we're learning now. Yeah. If you've been wondering how you can support the podcast, there are loads of options that can really help. These include donations, but if that's not something you're able to do, you can also help by leaving a review, sharing the podcast on social media, linking to the podcast from your website, or following me on social media. There are loads of possibilities. Find out more at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash support. One study I read found that hoarders compensate for their lack of relationships with people by seeking out objects which then can't meet their needs and can lead to more hoarding to, again, try and form attachments with stuff in the absence of people. And this is another vicious cycle. If somebody is very lonely or isolated, what steps can they take to start creating human connections and break out of that cycle? I think the most important step to start with is removing the shame that people with um, hoarding uh, behaviors feel. And what I want to say here is that, again, it's okay if your life includes a part that is devoted to hoarding. It's less okay if all your life is built around it. So instead of going into the all or nothing, you have to completely stop the hoarding and then meet other people. Let's keep that. But at the same time, let's start working on other parts of our life, like reaching out to existing connections. And, and my one might say that, yeah, but you know, I'm a hoarder. I don't want to go out there and tell people that I'm a hoarder. No, you're not a hoarder. You are somebody who is hoarding among other things. So again, we don't want to surround ourselves with only that identity. Like we are only this. You are way more things, way many more things than being somebody who hoards. So you are, yes, indeed, you are somebody who is hoarding, but at the same time, you are all the other things. And you are going out and you're reaching out to the people with all the other things, including the hoarding, not with just the hoarding identity. So that's the thing with that I think is the most important, working with the shame we feel and this labeling that this is who I am and nothing else. Reaching out to existing connections. You know, maybe sometimes we reconnect with people that we thought that it was not working or we thought that we were a burden but maybe they're still there and maybe they understand and, and it's okay. And just a simple message or going for coffee, maybe that will reignite a past uh, friendship or relationship, whatever was that. Was that. Um, I also believe in the power of joining uh, social groups or clubs. 
And I say, start with something that is already your interest or used to be your interest because you already have something to talk about. Because you, for example, photography, as I said before, or uh, knitting or uh, reading books, whatever it is that you're into, you already have topics to discuss with in comparison to starting a new hobby that you have no idea and you're a complete beginner and you have nothing to talk about it there. Yes, of course, you can start that activity as well, but start with something that feels more safe and join clubs where you can meet people that share the same interests. Another thing, uh, yeah, as we said before, uh, support groups. Maybe that can also help because we want to talk about that. And it doesn't feel comfortable to talk to somebody that you just met, but somebody who has already been there and knows you before you even start talking, again, creates this safe feeling. People, People who heal believe, people who are in the process of healing, They believe that they will just go out and spread the message of their own issues to everybody. But that's not the case. We are being selective with whom we are sharing that with. And being in a support group like that is exactly that. I'm sharing it with somebody who feels safe and who will understand. If somebody also needs more personal and tailored, let's say, help, therapy or counseling, helps a lot. As we said before, maybe there are traumas behind this uh, coping mechanism. uh, And we don't trust other people for very valid reasons that belong in in the past and in our history with uh, maybe main caregivers or with past relationships. And while healing from that, we might find a way to get out of this habit. So therapy and counseling would be a way to address any underlying issue that might hinder our ability to connect with others. Definitely. And I have a friend who is autistic and can't deal with kind of small talk, that kind of social interaction. It's not that she can't do it. It's that she doesn't see the point and just just can't in that respect. And she goes to various craft clubs and they're ideal because you're doing something else. So you're with people, but you're not expected to just talk because you're kind of occupied, but you can talk as well. And so there's another purpose behind it. It's not just about meeting people. It's talking about the book you've read or doing the craft And I think those dual purpose things can be good as well, because you might leave at the end of the evening and think, I don't think I made my new best friend, but I did sew Mm. a really nice handbag or something. Yeah, I, I, I found myself in a good energy with other people, which is already a change. And then, and I agree with what you say, because when we are, talking to somebody else we feel that we are in the spotlight but when we are doing an activity together with others the activity is on the spotlight and that takes a lot of stress from us definitely i think you just feel less pressure to perform yeah a lot of listeners will be thinking but what if i make friends and then i couldn't ever invite them to my home because of hoarding how does that have to get in the way of forming friendships i think again we're talking about shame eh? how we perceive ourselves and how other people will see us if they could see us through our own eyes so i don't think that this could get in the way and i'm going to use a very simple metaphor If you don't know how to cook, for example, would that stop you from meeting other people because you say, but I don't know how to cook. I cannot invite people to my place (laughs) because I don't know what to cook for them. No, you would go out and meet them in the restaurant. So I think it's the same thing. Just meet people outside the home. Um, What we want, especially in the beginning, is, again, to work with the shame, to, to start believing that we are worthy again despite or even 
because of this, we're still worthy. Um, and people like hanging around us and people like talking to us. So that's what we want. That's the most important. It's not important the where. It's most important that we need to see that people like us and have fun with us and they want to be around us. So you can meet outside the home. Um, focus on the activity that you're doing together. Maybe start a hobby together. Um, and once you start feeling safer, and I'm talking about the next step here, maybe that will also give you the incentive to work on the home environment as well. Because yes. now you have a new energy. Now you have a new um, self-love for yourself. Eh? And, and, and you want to be surrounded by a different environment. And you want to change it. So if you don't need to, if you feel comfortable doing so, then you will start working on improving your home environment. But that's the next step. First, let's focus on the people. And, and, and again, the hoarding is not the most important thing in your life. The person, you are the most important thing in your life, not your habits, not your home environment. That's what we, we need to, again, say to ourselves again and again and again. Absolutely. Hoarding is associated, as we've talked a lot about, with a lot of shame and stigma and judgment. It's not always self-imposed judgment. There is, you know, objective judgment as well. If somebody is holding back from building relationships because they don't know if or when they should disclose that they hurt hoard, what would you advise? I think the most important thing is take your time. Yeah. Remind yourself that, again, the hoarding is not the most important thing on you. Take your time. Um, it's a personal information and you're doing very well uh, that you are treating it with vulnerability. Yes, of course, that's that's your uh, special secret and you are not going to share it with just anybody. So take your time, see how the relationship rolls, see how you connect with the other person, talk about all the other things you want to talk because you are interesting, you, you have many things that you want to talk about. Um, and it's also important that we start with trusted individuals, people that we really trust. Either already we trust them or we see that they are trustworthy during the, um, uh, the growth of the relationship. It's also important to pick the right moment. Of course, at some point we are going to educate our friends, our relatives or the new people that we meet. Yes, of course, that's part of the uh, of the agenda for of, of being authentic and ho honest with our with our people around us, uh, but choose the right moment. Choose the moment that you feel comfortable. You don't need to push yourself, and you don't even need to ruminate over that. Is it now the right time? And shall I do it tomorrow? Shall I just put it aside? And whenever you feel like doing it, and it feels the right moment for you, then you can do it. Um, of course, as we said before, be honest and, and share the information you want to share. You can even take it one step at a time, share some things now, maybe some things at a later time. And, and I think, again, being realistic, I don't think that everybody would be uh, reacting in exactly the way we expect them to react. Let's be realistic. Not everybody has heard about this before. Not everybody knows what it means. Not everybody knows that this is just a part or a habit or a behavior. Maybe they have created different scenarios. Maybe they have met somebody like you in the past and that was a bad experience and maybe they're coming with a lot of luggage with them. So let's lower the expectations, prepare for different reactions and, and guide them. You know, that's 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 the power you have. This is just because you know what it feels like. Just guide them, you know, allow them to take their time uh, to process that. Allow them to ask questions about these and express your needs. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're telling them that so that you they know more about you and that you can connect in a better and a more authentic way. So express your needs if you if you want them to know how they can support you. If you want them, if you want to be accountable to them, if you want to start a new habit and you want them to you know to cheer you, like you know, I want to start 
changing, you know, one room at a time. Can you please, you know, cheer me or believe in me? Uh, if you want them to be patient with you or uh, if you just want them to understand your struggles, that's that's great. And just express these needs to them and, and that's good enough. And it can be really gradual. You can test the waters. Yeah. And you don't have to meet somebody and lay it all out. Hi, I'm Vasya, and I've got these problems. That's yeah. that's not how friendships start generally. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I usually say about relationships is that everybody's scared going in going in new relationship. Everybody. You think that you are scared because you are you have that the, the habit of hoarding, but the other person is also scared for their own reasons that we don't know yet. So everybody copes in a different way. Somebody will will spread the whole life in front of you in the first meeting. Somebody will trust you only after a hundred meetings and dates. <laughs> everybody has a different coping mechanism, but we are all scared because we have all been hurt from relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Vasya, that's been so helpful. I think I like this idea of rather than feeling like you have to take away the hoarding to add a friendship, you can start by adding friendships while just trying to make the hoarding a little bit smaller in your life. Yeah rather than thinking it has to disappear. It's adding rather than taking away. Your comfort blanket isn't being stolen. Exactly. It's just that you're getting something nice. Exactly. It's a, it's a part of your life. It's a part of our safety-seeking habits, but it's not all of it. It's not the whole life, and it's not the whole of our identity. It's a part of our identity. Absolutely. So if people want to find you online, on social media, anything like that, where can they do so? They can find me at antiloneliness.com. It's one word, anti-loneliness. Uh, and they can find information there about me, about the work that I do, about my team. I have a blog where I write articles on self-development, relationships and loneliness. And of course, if they would like to work with me or one or one of my team members, they can find all the information there. I also post a lot of educational, psychoeducational content in my channels, in my YouTube channel, which they can find with my name, Vasya Sar. It's the first three letters of my name, my last name, Vasya Sar. And the same with Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's talk secrets. I keep my hoarding secret and I often wonder about the effect that these secrets and this shame have on us and on mental health. To start breaking the taboo, I want to hear your hoarding secrets to discuss anonymously on the podcast. I've created a form to submit your secrets anonymously. I won't know who sends what. If you want to tell me your secret for a potential future episode, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash secret. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey, everyone. I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend, John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Hold up. 
So shout out this week to the Chris Evans show. Chris interviewed author Adam Grant and this short but sweet tip about getting started when you're stuck felt very relevant. Have a listen. Okay, and how can you get unstuck from not wanting to start? I think the the thing I learned actually in diving was I, I felt like I needed to build my confidence in order to take the leap to try a new dive. And I had that backward. You build your confidence by taking the leap. So I will link to the Chris Evans show in the show notes. Let's all try and take more of a leap. Okay, thank you for listening. And I will speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash support and do subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. There may be links in this podcast that earn me money. This doesn't come at any extra cost to you if you ever make a purchase through the links, and it helps to support the future of the podcast. Need new glasses or want a fresh new style? Warby Parker has you covered. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Every frame's designed in-house, with a huge selection of styles for every face shape. And with Warby Parker's free home try-on program, you can order five pairs to try at home for free. Shipping is free both ways, too. Go to warbyparker.com covered to try five pairs of frames at home for free. WarbyParker.com slash covered. Hi, this is Craig Robinson from Ways to Win. And support for this podcast comes from Invesco QQQ, the official ETF of the NCAA. Invesco QQQ is proud to sponsor this episode and even prouder to provide access to innovation for the last 25 years. Basketball has had innovations over the years, too. We're seeing the game played in new ways every day. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. Let's rethink possibility. Invesco Distributors, Inc. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Are you ready for some hoops off? Are you ready for some hoops Hoops off? off? This is legitimately (laughs) what you see people do right before they're going to fight. They take off their hoops, their earrings, because they don't want to get them ripped out of their ear Mm-mm. and they get ready for battle. Hey, I'm Liz. And I'm Karen. And you're listening to Hoops Off from Luminary. On this show, we take our hoops off to bring you the spiciest, the saltiest takes on each week's games. We'll also be reading books by our favorite players, reviewing Shaq sponsored products. And of course, we'll be bringing the tea. Should I, should I prepare the hot water? Oh, you better prepare the hot water. Please make sure to follow the show on your favorite podcast listening platform. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com